writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. In this episode of Right Pack Radio, we are going to talk about effective narrative. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host and producer, David Allen Lucas, author of Crazy Things, talker about villainy, voice actor, and president of St. Louis Writers Guild. And with me today is, of course, my lovely co-host... Whose birthday it is when this episode is airing. Yes. Happy birthday! Happy birthday. Happy birthday. And, you're, and you will always be age 25. Why Absolutely do I pick... Absolutely not. Real, why, <laughs> I pick, why I pick 25? You're legal enough to do anything that you want to do, and your insurance rates have permanently dropped. So you have more money. Actually, guys, I'm super old, and I'm going to be super old all my life, just as I was when I was 12. So, uh, I'm super old today. Happy birthday to me. My name is Kathleen Cayenne. I write speculative fiction under my own name. I write romance under the name Kaseka and Vita. You can find uh, the short stories that I published in uh, 2017 on nightmaremagazine.com and lightsbemagazine.com. And an essay on okafrica.com. And um, the fairy tree, the one in Lightspeed, is going to be in the best science fiction and fantasy of 2017, edited by Jonathan Strathen, out this month. And uh, I have super secret news super that I can't secret. tell anybody, but I'm also pretty happy about it. Well, congratulations on okay. that super, super mysterious, mysterious birthday. Just birthday. whisper it. We'll all not tell. I'm yeah. not allowed to say nothing. I'm just allowed to, hint, to hints. All right. I think I just joined the CIA. Okay, moving on. No one's going to kill or is it, me. Or is it more of a... Never mind. Um, also <laughs> with us today is... <laughs> Hi, my name is Chanel Achan. I write speculative fiction and literary fiction and all sorts of fiction, except for westerns. I, but um, I... <laughs> I write all yet, I, and yet I yeah. write all sorts of things. Um, yep, chasing my MFA. Yes, you yeah. have just been accepted to at least one school we've know of. So yeah, yeah congrats. Yeah, congrats. <laughs> and by the way, just for our fans to know, we have told her she will have to remote in like Ryan does to because she just because she's going away does not mean she cannot be a part of the right back. Because you're going away That's doesn't right. mean you're going away. Yeah. <laughs> And also with us is the Commodore of Steampunk. Thank you, yes. Uh, Brad Hardcook. Uh, I, uh, let's see, write, uh, as you said, Steampunk. I write a bunch of other stuff, too. Uh, you can find it all at bradhardcook.com. Uh, Tales of the Gear Blade is popping out every couple of uh, weeks here, usually about once a month, so check that out. Uh, you can find my novels uh, pretty much everywhere. And, uh, hey, if you want to know more about sword fighting, Stop over at Sword Rider at the Sword Riders Academy at SwordRiders.com, and uh, you know Ryan, you're beeping. Check it out. <laughs> Ryan's car was beeping, and yes, that is something new that we wanted to uh, announce. Brad <laughs> and well, Brad mostly. I'll be his <laughs> proverbial oogie, which in martial arts that's the um, person yeah, you beat up on. Um, yeah, they're on sword fighting. So what's it called again? Uh, it's the Sword Riders Academy. You can find it at swordriders.com. Excellent. It's a blog. I just talk about sword fighting. It's, yeah, it's fun. Yes. <laughs> yes. And also with us today is... Dante Carlisle. I'm a writer of crime fiction. And hopefully by the time this is aired, I will have my new short story series called Afterlife coming out. Nice. Yeah. Excellent. And our artist in residence... Uh, my name is Jennifer Stolzer. I'm a children's book author and illustrator. Since we are in April, I need to remind everybody that I'm launching a new book with Jessica Matthews on the 28th at Main Street Books in St. Charles and St. Louis and on the internet everywhere else. It's going to be called Sparkle. I am working on it currently <laughs> as we talk today. Um, I also will be launching a book of my own. Right now I'm thinking it's going to be the second dog park book. So if anybody has is familiar with my previous picture book, self-published, called Dog Park. 
Uh, keep an eye out on Amazon for its sequel uh, coming out at the end of this month, God willing. Sweet. Yay, Excellent. Yahoo. And also with us, coming in remotely, Ryan, are you still there? Well, okay, I'll play Ryan. We have Ryan P. Freeman, who is with us in spirit. He's actually really with us. Apparently he's having a technical problem. He is a high fantasy writer coming from Hannibal, Missouri, proving that Mark Twain is not the only no novelist to come from there. So, uh, today we're going to talk about effective narrative. That bit of writing that we do in between all the points of dialogue where people are talking to each other. So, what makes narrative effective, and does it have anything to do with points of view and genre? And yes, I just set up a softball. <laughs> well, I was actually going to say, you should start off by saying, this, these are the parts that you need to show, not tell. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, talk to us about this. Uh, showing that telling? No, that's not the episode. Uh, there it is. <laughs> I know that. Talk about uh, this. Yeah, part. no, it basically, yes, as we described it, is the parts between dialogue. It's the parts where you get to describe stuff, uh, actions, um, set scenes, delve into characters' minds, um, all that kind of fun stuff. Excellent. <laughs> Does it? Is it pertaining to points of view? <laughs> I mean, point blank. Does it matter if you're writing first person, second person, third person, third person limited? That just describes who the narrator is, or the, who's telling the narrative. Uh, in first person, obviously, it's going to be your internal thoughts. Uh, you know, something like that. You can have an internal narrator, sure. I guess. Yeah, you probably could. Yeah, I simple. don't see why that would be a problem. There are probably books that have totally done that. Yeah. Uh, and then in third person, obviously, you're going to have the either omniscient narrator, who's the big godlike character, or maybe some version of somebody's internal thoughts or something along those lines. Uh, I would like... I'll break down narration in terms of third person... Yeah. further because it's something that I feel strongly about in character wise lots of people forget in a third person limited novel that your narrator is still your main character uh, they might have a slightly different tone because it's being spoken of in third person but they're residing in their head and the tone needs to match the character that it's following so that's, uh, that's one way to achieve the voice that you're looking for so if my character is a, a teenage boy and he's speaking like a distinguished 50 year old historian there's a dissociation there it's a little oh. discordant and it it doesn't pack his his actions don't feel as close to the audience you don't feel as immersed because you've got that little bit of you know it doesn't really feel like he's experiencing what you're talking about so that's, uh, that's my point of reference for narration for when I'm writing my books, because I like to write in third person limited. And third person limited is that the camera's being held by one guy. So everything that that guy looks at and feels and sees is what's being communicated to the audience through the narration. The, that's not omniscient, as mentioned earlier. Omniscient is someone who can see into everyone's head. And in that case, trying to nail down a specific person's voice is as confusing because you're looking for things, then you need to have a separate narrator in mind who's looking out at everything. But that's that narrator, everyone's pointing at me, so we'll get, uh, <laughs> that narrator needs to, needs to match the, um, the genre and tone of the book in general. So if the book is aimed at YA kids, and it's omniscient, meaning you can hear the thoughts of everybody and you can feel the feelings of everybody, the person who is feeling all those feelings needs to be the genre, the, the persona of your assumed reader. Mm -hmm. So if that person sounds like a history professor, that's also going to feel discordant. If you're writing an adult novel and the narration is very juvenile, then you're going to assume that the people in the book are all kind of dumb. So, or that the, the audience is going to feel like you think that they are dumb. <laughs> that's not yeah. good either. That's never a good thing. So omniscient, you're writing... Uh, a character that implies your reader <laughs> like what their internal dialogue should be as they're looking at what's going on and as a when you're doing limited third person limited then you need to write from the point of view of the person holding the camera at the time 
and think about how they would use language and what they would notice and what sort of words they would pick. Kathleen and just, Chanel? I just wanted to throw out an example um, of omniscient narrator that comes across often as third person limited but is omniscient. Um, the uh, Old Kingdom series by Garth mm -hmm. Nix that Chanel introduced me to and has been wonderful to read. The first book is Sabriel and um, most of the book is from Sabriel's perspective but you do periodically dip into other people's heads that she is meeting and interacting with as the book goes along. Do you dip into their heads mid-scene or do you dip into their heads separately? Actually, mm -hmm. actually <laughs> it's it's often mid-scene. There, there are point okay so <laughs> generally you can do omniscient and limited a few ways like with Sabriel it's typically in one person's point of view but they dip into other heads within the scene just as they're applicable mm -hmm. but it also switches narrators at certain points mm -hmm. which is something else you can do if you're mostly doing limited yeah switching view. narrators is a hundred percent okay and still be limited <sighs> as long as there's a point of delineation between switching narrators Mm -hmm. Yes, there is that. In but, which um, case, you should also switch the way your narration sounds, because you're talking from the head of a different character. Yes. Right. Chanel? Um, I totally agree. Jen just, like, took what I was going to say right out of my mouth. Sorry. Because, <laughs> still my thunder. Um, <laughs> so, basically, like what Kathleen was saying, in the Old Kingdom series, um, Nyx does have a tendency to keep a, a very general... Um, narrator for a particular character as if to say from Sabriel's point of view and then like almost like a little gem stuck in there you'll get a perspective that is not hers while it's still being within the scene of her narration mm -hmm. and then the next scene will come and it'll be from a different person's point of view mm -hmm. whereas I tend to do something similar but different I tend to keep a narrator that is consistent for each person for a scene, like mm -hmm. each scene will have a specific narrator, and that may change for a, for a different scene, but it's generally very, very delineated. As in, the scene has Kayla as the narrator, and the voice sounds like Kayla, and versus the next scene, which is told from the commander's point of view and sounds like the commander. And one of the things that I enjoy and yet have a hard time with is making the narrator, while not sounding like a 27-year-old black girl, mm -hmm. still has the feel of her in their speech, mm -hmm. um, which is different from the other people in the story. So it's not just enough to say, okay, it switches narrators, but it has to have something of, I think it has to have something of each character in the style of narration as well. I'm going to go Brad and then Ryan. All right, to jump in, uh, wiki it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, no. oh, yeah. So here is narration and the definition of such and the three types of narration listed uh, in the wiki. Uh, so narration is the use of a written or spoken commentary to convey a story to an audience. Yeah, we all just talked about that. Yes. Uh, there are three types. There is the narrative point of view, which we've been talking about, the perspective or the type or type of person, personal or non-personal lens through which the story is communicated. Obviously, Jen's whole camera analogy is mm -hmm. yep. such. The narrative voice, the format or type of presentational form through which a story is communicated. We've talked about the different types of voices that you use for the different types of characters that you're going to be, uh, you know, trying to put forward to the reader. And the narrative time, the grammatical placement of the story's time frame in the past, the present, or the future in order to frame the story. Uh, a narrator is a personal character or a non-personal voice that the creator, or the author, of the story develops to deliver information to the audience, particularly about the plot. Um, and then this is actually my favorite of it all. Narration encompasses not only who tells the story, but also how the story is told. For example, by using stream of consciousness, or the unreliable narration. Mm -hmm. So, there, everything we were just talking about, wiki up. Mm. Brian and then myself. <laughs> uh, this is kind of a, a cool take. Uh, shout out to uh, my own uh, Animal Writers Guild. Last time we met in February, one of the writers came and uh, she had read this really cool, uh, I guess it's kind of like a short story, but the, uh, the book the book, the uh, short story was self-aware and narrated itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, it was really, yeah, it was really clever. Um, 
like it, it knew like that you were reading it and it, it wanted to like like learn about itself by you reading it um, so it was breaking and, the fourth wall but, from the sounds of that yeah yeah no it really was and it, like it wanted the reader to define it like its own genre because it didn't know and most it was, famously uh, it was really interesting and i was like that's a really cool idea i'm gonna have to like borrow that well, one of the greatest kids book in the history of kids books is written that way. Yeah. There's a monster at the end of the book. Yeah. 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 One of the greatest kids book of all time. What um, book is this? I don't. There's know. a monster at the end of this book. Yeah. There's oh, a monster at the end. That's of this the name book. of the book. Yeah. It's a okay. Sesame Street picture book. <laughs> <laughs> I am sorry I didn't catch that was the it's title. I thought that was a reference to the ending. Also, the Never Ending Story. What is it? Yeah. 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 It is a reference to the end of the story. Right. It doesn't matter. That's all I want to throw out. I just thought it was a really creative take. And yeah. uh, it is. Um, being, being purposeful and intentional about uh, how you uh, how you use dialogue in a book, um, how, you, how you use narration like specifically as a part of the book's like, structure mm-hmm. uh, can be really clever. Like, it doesn't just have to be whatever happens to spill out in your pen or your, your, your keys as you're typing. Like, by specifically being intentional about what you use and how you use it, uh, it can almost become, well, in some cases, it can become its own character. Agree. I'm going to go, I'm going to go jump onto genre. So, Brad, where are you going with yours? And... The pitfalls of narration. Go for it. Yeah, yeah I was just going to throw out, because this is where you're going to make, like, 99% of your mistakes. <laughs> yes. Is in narration. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, i.e. purple prose. Oh, God, That's yeah. probably the biggest one, just making the descriptive narration just way too incredibly long. Or too detailed. I mean, I you know, as much as we're all used to the cinematic beginning, and when you're reading a book, you don't necessarily need to start me at the stars and pull into the planet and then come down <laughs> into the forest and then show me the tree and then the guy standing next to the tree and then zoom in on what he's got in his hand. An Ewok. You know, no. you, you, you <laughs> just start with the guy and his, you know, what he had in his hand. So this is, this is the things of narration. And then when you're in somebody's head, um, you know, we actually don't think about a lot. <laughs> we don't. Speak for yourself. Uh, okay. Yeah, please. You know, like, like wait. Well, huh? We were left with our thoughts, but when you're walking down the street, you're not thinking, "Oh, the pavement is beige and the street is ah, cracked yes. with you know lines of this and that." Lady's wearing these shoes. Now, I will say, oh, as writers, we totally see the world that way. And that's a problem. But average normal people do not. Uh, They just go through the world and artists, maybe, you know, photographers see it a little differently. Mostly I see shapes. Yeah, there you go. Boy, that guy's a weird shape. (laughs) (laughs) You know, we all see the world differently, but we don't. So when you're you're doing narration of people's internal thoughts, you've got to limit it to what's actually just important for the reader to know. And I'd say in any narration, it's probably important just to limit it to what the reader needs to know. (laughs) Okay, um, right now, just for those, since we are not video, we're audio, uh, just so you know, Chanel's doing a, what we call a dovetail, she's and she's using it like a dagger, she's a point at point point so, so what is your dagger dovetail? That's, okay, a, new, that's so, a new version. Okay. So, to put, a, to put a nice little glossomer curtain on top of what you just said. It's important to know what the, me, the reader needs to know, but it also is important to know what the character or narrator would know in yes. these circumstances. Yes. Yes. So it's be, it'd be great to, like, you know, um, say, tell the reader, okay, the reader needs to know that around the corner there's a bank robbery happening. Right. But would the character walking down the street know that from first person? No. Right. So, like, it's really important to pay attention to the way in which you reveal information and would the person that you're exploring this situation from their point of view, would they know that information? Another bit. I'm coming back to you and boom, boom, boom. That's so. actually, I, that actually dovetails perfectly into what I was going to say about that was, um, that actually, you, you stole essentially what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are stealing each other's thunder. <laughs> but in, in that situation, if there was a heist happening around the corner, like you said, it would be something the character would it would be great if they knew that. It would be fantastic. <laughs> but are they going to know that? But you can you can take a focus onto the things that they would know. Perhaps you hear the sirens. Mm-hmm. Perhaps you know you see people running from the other way or running the other direction, 
And depending on what kind of character you have, either they're going to swiftly turn around or they're going to go, hey, what's that? And run towards it. And you right. get a chance it's to those... define your character and yes. immerse your audience. Yes. yes. You Any, every that's good single ways situation. Of using narration. <laughs> those, those caveats and what you put in matter a whole lot. Okay, go straight to her. Right. Okay, we'll go straight okay. to Kathleen. Oh. Uh, yeah, I think that goes to Jen's point early in the episode. You need to point out what the character who's, mm -hmm. whose mind you're writing is would notice. Like, mm -hmm. And Brad, I, I know you said you know normal people wouldn't necessarily notice whatever, but I have to say, some of the examples you gave are things that Chanel would definitely notice. <laughs> and some of the, the things like Jen, who is an artist, not just a writer, sees the world in shapes. And um, David can tell when someone is able to fight and hold their own in a fight or not just by looking at them. So, I mean, we all see the world differently. very differently. Right, so we all assess the world in different ways. One of the ways I can tell that I'm immersed mm -hmm. in a particular story and narrator is whether when I go on a walk, I start noticing the things that they would notice instead of the things that I would notice. Mm -hmm. That's so, interesting. There you go. I mean, and there are also ways in, in narration to... Um, to, sh to convey things to the reader that the character won't necessarily notice. So, um, back to the Old Kingdom series that I mentioned earlier, because I've, I've just finished hearing all these on audiobooks, and it's fresh in my mind. There is a, uh, a character named Clariel, who is basically <laughs> a feral woodland child. That is not how she is described in the book, but that is how I feel about her. Mm -hmm. She's a feral woodland child who needs to go off and live in the woods by herself. And she is... <laughs> She's grown up happily in the woods, and then she's stuck in a big city, interacting with people. And she is clearly an introvert and not used to dealing with people. So when she sits in at a tea ceremony with people who are her peers, she's noticing the way that one girl, for instance, will give her a dirty look when this boy flirts with her. But she won't register that what he's doing is flirting necessarily. She'll take it as him being antagonistic. So the narrative, the narrator, uh, the... The narrative itself will show you there is a love triangle going on that is only going in one direction. Mm -hmm. But the, the point of view character is completely oblivious to this. So there are ways, say, if there's a bank robbery going around, going on around the corner, that you as the writer can convey, can give the reader clues that such a thing is going on. Mm -hmm. As Dante said, you know, mm -hmm. sirens, yeah. people running in opposite directions. And if it were someone like Chanel, she would definitely notice if people who looked like they were, you know, packing some things in their outfits were going in one direction, and then suddenly people came from another direction. You don't have to spell everything out, but you can leave clues for the reader for them to mm -hmm. interpret. But the point is to limit it to what they would know, not yeah. necessarily right. everything. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, the other thing is, <laughs> there's, a, well, there's a difference between what they, they would know and what they would yeah, notice. Yeah, Lester Batman. Because, <laughs> Lester Batman, what they would notice. Yeah, like... Because, like I said, Clariel notices certain things in the people's faces and actions, but she does not interpret them in the way that the reader interprets them, because she is not clever enough to notice. She's not clever. Just really uh. quick, I want to point out something that, I don't know if we all caught or not, but something that Kathleen said, and we've talked about voice in previous episodes, what you just described, how we see things, how the characters see things in our stories, leads to, leads to the distinctive voice. We all have. Going over. So then you would have to dis uh, distinguish between what your character knows, is, what your mm -hmm. character would know, versus what your narrator would know. Right. Because depending on the type of narration that you have, you could very easily say, "Oh, I, I say from a, if it's from like an omniscient point of view, the character didn't see X, Y, Z happening." And like that's something that the character wouldn't know, but it's completely admissible based on the rules you set up in the story by having an omniscient point of view. That is completely acceptable to give the reader as information. Like it's kind of like a puzzle as in this, as to say, okay, the reader wouldn't know this, but by having this overseeing eye, you can tell the reader this by, while also not having the, re the narrator, sorry, the character know it. Okay, mm -hmm. um, Jen? Ryan, I know, I, I know you've got a reservation. Is it a dovetail or is it a res? Or is it a res? It's a dovetail. Oh, it's a dovetail. Okay, so I'll go Jen, then Ryan, and then maybe Kathleen. She puts it back up. I'm not sure yet. I need to look up the name of this first. Okay, um, so go Jen. Okay. Well, I was going to pull into that, that, um, the, uh, oh my goodness. Alfred Hitchcock's definition of suspense mm -hmm. is that the audience knows something that the character does not. Exactly. So doing that thing is a great way to raise suspense in a suspense or a mystery novel. Mm -hmm. You're writing from a 
a third person, it could still be, it's like an omniscient, but, you know, you're not talking about what's going on in the killer's head. You can, you don't have to include what's going on in everyone's heads. But being outside of your detective's head, you can give clues and sort of speak to the audience and see if they're going to figure it out and raise the stakes on your, your protagonist in the same way. Um, that then you have to keep track, though, of what the audience knows versus what the character knows. Right. Because you've broken that contract of everything that's stated in the narration is known by the protag. Because that's how it goes in Limited, is mm -hmm. that everything stated in narration is known by the protagonist, which is why you don't have to use the feel words. It's like you don't know what, you don't have to say, um, he watched the leaves fall. You can just describe the leaves falling because by nature of describing them, you know that he's seen them because he's right. the protagonist. Mm -hmm. But omniscient, you have to say who saw what and where. Mm -hmm. And you have to find creative ways to do that without using the word saw all the time. <laughs> right. I'm going to come back. Actually, this comes back to both what Chanel and Jen says. I want to talk about genre in a bit, how that, how that does, how that controls narration as well. But Ryan, you're dovetailed, and then I'm going to throw this out before I lose it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. So uh, two things. One, uh, I was just thinking about when we were talking about this topic. Uh, another great example of this is uh, King's Dark Tidings. Uh, it's, it's, I read a, like an ebook version, but it's, it's hilarious because in, in, the, in the series, the main character, uh, Rez, he, uh, he's a you know, master assassin, fighter, manipulator, uh, you know, uh, all of the above, um, but he's completely socially inept. Like, completely. And it's hilarious. And so he's like, he, and, you know, he, he leaves his compound and, and, uh, and he doesn't know what friends are. Like, he doesn't know very basic things, and so, like, he's trying to figure out, like, all what all these people, like, what they what they mean in this tavern that he's in. But he doesn't realize that, like, some of them are flirting with him, some of them, like, just want him to pay his bill. Like, so, you know, he's, like, completely gone. And so, like, for a reader, you know, for who, who is socially apt, um, you know, it's hilarious because you can clearly see like by purposely making a character uh, and then using the uh, the uh, narrative um, to, sh to highlight this, to highlight the fact that he's an act, uh, makes it funny. Um, so you can, you can do more than just, you know, stick your case and, and leave. You can use it um, intentionally to maybe make it serious, make it ominous, make it funny um, by being aware of your characters and then playing to either their strengths or their weaknesses. Um, and then the one last thing I was going to throw in, so at the time of this recording, I recently got back from a little trip to Albuquerque to visit my family, and uh, so, of course, anybody who's flown, um, the best place that people watch, uh, I think, anyways, is, is the airport. Yes. Um, yeah. And so I totally understand the idea that, like, like we don't see things the same way um, because we are orientated differently. Um, I'm a marketer and a writer. And so I, I, one of the first things I'll do is I'll, I'll profile people based on, you know, what they're wearing, uh, uh, maybe, maybe their age, their demographics. Um, and then so I try to like, okay, where are they going? What are they doing? What kind of character are they? Um, and I'm not, it's not something I'm trying to do. It just happens. Um, I just kind of do it automatically. So at, at an airport, it's like a candy land for me because there's so many different people and they're all going somewhere else. And, you know, they all just... They have that airport look on them, um, and I love it. It's perfect. If I ever need ideas for, for new characters, I can just jump there in my head, um, and I can use them and maybe kind of their outlook that I imagine on life uh, for a narrator's voice. Brett, and then over to Tay. Yeah, so basically, like, what we kind of throw around a lot are a bunch of different uh, narrators. Uh -huh. uh, and there's some really great ones out there that I truly love. Like, uh, obviously, one of the one of the fun ones is the I'm writing this book like years later narrator. Mm -hmm. So it's the narrator, it's the main character, mm -hmm. but it's years later, and he gives you insights throughout the story. Stand by me is a great version of that. Uh, the the chorus or the you know like of uh, you know the Greek tragedies or even of like the muses of uh, Hercules, uh, the Disney movie and stuff, or even. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the guy who cut in on uh, the Dukes of Hazard for all the old people in the audience. 
Uh, right about them, yeah, them the author themselves decoys. and strangers uh, in fiction. Exactly, but you know, these <laughs> are all different types yeah. of narrators yeah. that you can use to kind of pop in and do oh. a... It's like an omniscient, an omniscient narrator. Something different than just having the classic, you know, one perspective on the page kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can do all kinds of different things cool. with narration, but I just wanted to throw that out because no. there's a ton of different narrators out there yeah. that are fun to play with. Yeah, those and are, you those two are, are now ideas. leading up to what I'm trying to build to. So go ahead, and then I'm going uh -oh. to do the shoot here. I'm, I'm going to derail it then. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hold that derailing. Hold that derailing. Hold that derailing. Because right. I want to talk about. All right. I'm, I'll hold it. <laughs> How does genre affect your point of view plus also how you narrate? I think it does. In fact, I'm going to say, lately I've been writing hard-boiled mystery. Hard-boiled mystery is written from first point of view, first person point of view, and it is written gritty, it is written hard. Let me give you an example. I walked up to Brad Cook as he sat at the, sat at the bar with his pint of beer. I was looking forward to punching him. He looked at me, he stood up, I punched him. He <laughs> sat back down. He sat back down and bled, and then I leaned over him. And threatened another. Okay, sorry. Right. I love you. I just picked on you that way. That's can all. I, can I recommend that for a different genre? genre? Yes, actually, perfect. Please rewrite that for another genre, Brad. I'm sorry, you get might get my ass in. kicked today. Great. Yeah, just over it up. At least every genre possible. I walked into the bar and saw him. Long dark hair falling over his shoulder. <laughs> Five o'clock shadow. <laughs> the beginnings of a beard. Uh, beer in his hand. Droplet of water cascading over one finger and down onto the table. I really wanted to punch him. <laughs> In the mouth. With my mouth. <laughs> and there you go. Uh, I mean, these are perfect examples. And in, the, and in both cases here, we did it from first point person point of view. These are both from David's point of view. Uh, <laughs> I just need that said. Whoa, whoa. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Back that up. You, you, you have to read more of her stuff you if you don't understand. Like, if I wrote that... I write, I write, would be from a, yeah. uh, I write queer romance, guys. I know. That was not going to be a straight couple. No. I love you both. <laughs> okay, so how does, that was perfect. Actually, you know, even though I was like, wait, 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 we need to back that up. But no, I went from a hard point point of view where the description is pow, 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 and I do mean that literally like gun. And you went more to gay the romance, romance, to the gay romance side. <laughs> Sensual descriptions. Sensual so descriptions how does particular characters? Exactly. So um, I've got Chanel, I've got Dante, and then I've got Jen. So tell me more. Tell me. Tell me how the genres determine how you can describe it, as well as different points of view. Oh, so I guess I could should start this off by saying I don't know how much my literary writing counts as its own, its own genre, but there's certainly in a difference in the way that I write. Like there are certain completely unreal, not even unrelated, just certain descriptions that I would include in a literary piece that would have no place in speculative fiction. Like, for example, there was a, a story that I wrote and I was like, oh, the airplanes are tracing pale scars across the sky. And I'm just like, I don't really know where I would put that anywhere else. <laughs> but it, it, it totally fits into this literary this literary thing that I'm constructing here. So it, it's 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 the type of descriptions that you choose and the way that they're connected. Because I, I find that when um, in certain literary things the disconnections of the descriptions are a little different too. I apparently was not gonna derail this as badly as I thought. <laughs> Yay! Okay. Um, what I was gonna bring up actually before that was the, the differences in the genres comes a lot with pacing. Mm -hmm. Is, you know, as far as romance goes, it's going to be a much slower pace. It's going to be have a build up. Whereas with the hard boiled mysteries, it's, it's, you're trying to ramp up suspension as quickly as possible. It's going to become more of a roller coaster. As, I mean, you can get through a chapter and every other page is going to, going to send you up or down. And so those, that narrative is either going to get more or less detailed, depending on how, essentially, how quickly you want the reader to fly through your narrative. You know, with something like what, what David was saying with the, the hard-boiled mystery, you want them to fly through that, get to the action quick, and then it calms back down again. It's, you, you want to surprise them with that. Whereas as with the, with the romance, it's going to 
there's there's going to be a build up because that suspense that that anticipation angst, that angsty <laughs> anticipation is what gets people off right that's, that's, where, that's where they're looking for it. Um, you went there stop that uh oh <laughs> <laughs> but I mean you're even even beyond genre in in individual genre I mean in an individual story the narrative is going to change depending on the pace of a particular scene what's happening in it that that narrative is going to either grow or shrink depending on what you're writing so I'm not I didn't so, say anything I was that waiting, time I was waiting for it. I was <laughs> waiting, yeah, we were all waiting I was waiting, <laughs> waiting for the drop to go um, I know are you dovetailing into Dante so I'm going to let you go Kathleen then Jen then Brian not me not, in, not um, Jen anymore okay I was just going to say pacing is an important part of narration as Dante was, was mm-hmm. uh, talking about um, I read a short short of Chanel's earlier today and I noticed how there was it was handwritten and I noticed how there was a point when my eyes were trying to go so fast to find out what was next because it was like a really tense scene that like when they tripped over a correction on the page I was like why are you doing this to me like I was so (laughs) mad because it was going so fast at that point my eyes could not keep up with the story and when you're doing like really tense fight scene well when you're doing a fight scene, mm-hmm. you kind of want shorter sentences, mm-hmm. like yes. um, not nearly so many. Oh my goodness, I'm horrible at grammar. Not nearly so many clauses. You want action, like like mm-hmm. punching is going on. But when you want to draw it out, you want to go into more detail. You want if it's really tense, go ahead and take some some time describing things. People will go absolutely crazy <laughs> waiting to find out whether or not that trigger is going to get pulled. Like. Oh my goodness! You can you can make people so angry. <laughs> okay, Dante is dovetailing into Kathleen. I still got you, Ryan. I'm, I'm sorry, but that that essentially the the fight scenes mentioned mm-hmm. fits perfectly with what we were saying earlier about what are the characters going to notice. I obviously a few of us here have been in fights. When you are in a fight, you tunnel vision on what you're what's going on. You could have a freaking giraffe run behind you. <laughs> and unless you are prepared for that, you may not notice. <laughs> and so that's like she said, those those sentences are gonna get shorter. Your the descriptions go away. You don't notice that ah oh, there's a pine tree right next to this guy that I'm about to punch in the face. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You you, you, you should I'm not be that. trying to describe anything in those fight scenes. It should be cut and dried, short sentences, no clauses. I always stop to check the weather mid-fight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so just to put it into this trained, this trained fighter's point of view, um, the, to borrow, borrow from what you just did, I'd be punching the person. Oh, there's a draft going through. Okay, draft is non-threatening. I continue punching. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> it's a sentient draft. It definitely means draft. you harm. It's like draft. Okay, fine, nothing. Um, Ryan, and then I've got... Dovetailings going on. So Ryan, you've been waiting, and then it looks like Kathleen's next. Okay. Uh, well, I don't, I don't know about drafts, but um, <laughs> when I'm, I'm writing, um, I fancy. Um, I know my goal with my genre is is to be immersive. That's something that yeah. people have always complimented me on, and it's something that I just find myself naturally doing. Um, I feel like the genre found me. It's just. Whenever I write, that's what it ends up coming out as, and I want to be immersive. Um, so I've had to, with one of the struggles with one of the current books I'm writing, Nameless, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm too immersive, and I need to pull back. I need to like tweak my own genre strength um, because it's messing with the um, with the story. It's 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 too much. Um, and it's hard because that's just naturally what I go to. Um, that's that's what I want to do. My my goal is to make you forget your reading, um, yeah. and yeah. it's a hard thing to do, especially when you know I'm I'm the one writing it here and I'm really into it, you know. Um, and I find that even writing that way makes me blind to the proverbial giraffes running by, and I'm the one that's supposed to know what's going on, you know. So, anyways, that's my two cents. Go for it, Kathleen. Speaking of wanting an immersive experience for the reader and uh, fight scenes where unnecessary things happen, Hmm. this is not the time is a thing 
that when it pops into my head, it takes me out of the story. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> if there is a fight scene going on and everything is super tense and one bit of diverted attention could get everyone killed mm-hmm. and you stop to have a conversation about your love life with someone or Uh-oh. to just do something completely... <laughs> This is not the time. During an, oh my goodness, it takes me out of the story so fast. It makes me so angry. Let's not talk about how that happens in movies all the times, but we're just gonna. Like, I understand that there is the trope where, like, the woman has to get with the dude, even though she's just met him in movies because she needs a mandatory romance subplot. I this is not the time at those all the time. However, even when it's not like that, like, pay attention to what your character would be focused on. If they are worried, if they're in fear for their life, they're probably not going to stop and do something completely inane and mundane that they could do later. Probably not. And if they do, they're going to lose the fight. Or if they do, <laughs> like, take them out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Bring their attention right back to where they are real quick. Because, I mean, mm-hmm. like, I got ADD. I can get distracted by things. But, like, if someone shoots at me because I'm distracted, I will not be distracted anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how that kicks in. Distraction over... consequences make yeah. them happen. Jen, I am coming to you, but to borrow from your phrase, yes, it's more like, I am punching Brad, and then I remember my loved romance of... I don't know, right. picking somebody else uh, <laughs> of my wife, Melanie, and how she was the other day, and then suddenly, breath punch hits yeah. me right in the nose. And then I closed my eyes and became one with the Force while Kylo Ren's freaking lightsaber was out of my throat. And yeah. then, ten minutes later, I'm I threw a tank because my name is Wonder Woman. Like, so mad. Yeah. Yeah. So mad. Um, okay. End on that one. Go Not ahead. Not the time. Jen. Um, I just wanted to point out that... I have a flashback. Lampshading oh. doesn't help you. Just don't do it. What is lampshading? Lampshading is when you call attention to the thing that's the problem. Like, mm-hmm. it's funny. Like, oh, so when once, you know, when Will Turner pulls Elizabeth close and says, I really wanted to marry you, and she says, now's not the time. That's that kind of funny, help. but it doesn't help, though. It still isn't the time. And if you actually wanted to have it be an intense fight scene, then you wouldn't have included it. Right. That'd be later. Um... If you're writing a comedy scene, like in in the Pirates movie, that was meant to be a funny point. Mm, And perhaps it was a funny point, but did it detract from the scene as a whole and the goal of that scene? Did it make the movie worse by including it? I enjoy the Pirates of the Caribbean alone. (laughs) Go for it, though. Jen, you're usually the one that gets me seeing these YouTube... um, (laughs) videos that like kind of to. the video essays mm-hmm. what was it bathos that folding ideas was it yes Call, okay bathos. i'm gonna need your help with this feel free to interrupt me because i'm gonna describe it badly mm-hmm. okay. but um on a note related to that um folding ideas on youtube talks like created the term bathos for i don't like, think he created it i think it's an actual like latin mm-hmm. term yeah. okay. um, keep going so so he he talked about bathos which is used a lot in the marvel films where a very, very tense moment will be broken up, like, suddenly by a joke that kind of makes everyone laugh a little bit, but it completely shoots through the tension. Mm -hmm. And, like, that's a narrative choice you can make, but Uh it it doesn't allow you to get... It is a term, Dante? It's a real word, yeah. It's a real word. Oh, yeah, it is. But it doesn't allow you to go as deep with the tension, and it, it kind of... It breaks, breaks attention, yeah. so you yeah. have to work really it's, hard to kind of either recapture it or just let it go. The point mm-hmm. that uh, he was making in the video, and everyone look up, look up Folded Ideas because it's a really good show on um, awesome. YouTube. Uh, don't get thrown off by the fact that half of it has a puppet in it. He stops using the puppet later. <laughs> but it's, um, it's still awesome. Yeah, the, the point is that um, he was bringing it up as an example for why people, while they enjoy watching the Marvel movies while they watch them, it doesn't really resonate and stick with you with the, the way that another movie style might. And uh, it's interesting, I don't know, I don't remember if he brings this up in the video or not, but people trying to mimic that Marvel style, because Marvel is like action and humor and it makes everyone smile, which is good, that's the goal. If the goal was to make someone feel something really deeply though, they're not attempting that. You know, Marvel's doing what Marvel does, and it does it well, as shown by the box office. True. But um, if you look at how recently DC has tried to mimic that style without understanding, because DC's <laughs> DC's Zack Snyder movies are trying to make you feel something deep and meaningful, and then they chop their own legs off by yeah. trying to include a joke from The Flash for no reason. Because movies. they know that Marvel did it, and they think that just because Marvel cuts everything with a joke, that that's why it's popular. 
It's like, well, Marvel knows what it is. DC is breaking its own knees. It has no heart. It has, it's it's a dip, it's a it's the difference between trying to create something cohesive and trying to create something that conflicts with itself. It's like the well, idea. Of, copies, you know? Well, <laughs> Just, Justice League was yeah. half made by Zack Snyder and half made by Joss say, Whedon, and it you has can a feel lot to do with having one director. Like you can watch that movie and you can see, okay, well, aside from the beard, <laughs> aside from the mustache, you can see which scenes were Joss scenes and which scenes were Zack scenes. That's it's a tone thing. It's an intention thing. Yes. It's a narrative thing. thing. Joss made it orange. <laughs> <laughs> well, Zach made it blue. <laughs> it's wow. like the difference between like, know, like knowing the rules so that you can break them and just breaking the rules mm -hmm. kind of haphazardly. Mm -hmm. yeah. The yes. effect is not the same and you're not going to get the potency that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's the old adage, and I'm coming over to Dante again, that's the old adage of know the rules and know how to break them correctly. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this still kind of goes along with what you were saying as far as uh, to put that into short-term deals is is what is the narrative that you're putting in necessary to the story as you were saying with the Pirates of the Caribbean thing is it, not only does it does it one make it better does it move the story along or three do you just really want to put this couple of lines into this paragraph in because damn it it sounds really freaking good and then number four, I'm going to throw it in, I'm going over to Chanel, and that is, did you change voice? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go for it, Chanel. This is the point at which uh, killing your darlings is a must. Oh, yeah. Because, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> just because it sounds really freaking cool, and you really wanted to put it in there, may not mean that it's the right place or the mm -hmm. right time for that in this story. It may not happen in this story at all for that couple of lines. That's when you like save your graveyard and keep it moving. Like, there's... There's no the reason to. There's no reason to, like, toot your own horn while no. while you're trying to make a, a good story. What is the graveyard? Just be clear. Oh, um. So, one thing that I do, and I know a lot of other people do too, when they're writing, is instead of just deleting things that you've written, mm -hmm. like, cop, uh, cut it, paste it in a separate document, and just keep all the things that you've taken out in that document. That way, if like on a separate revision you want to go back and you're like actually this would be a good place for that couple of lines you can go back to the graveyard and copy it and pin it back in versus it just being gone forever definitely uh back to murder your darlings another darling that you may have to murder is research i um. understand you know all about the use of buttons mm. in 17th century british dress for women in specific but if it's not putting this, if it's not pushing the story forward, if it's not informing you about character, take it out. To quote, and he may have been quoting someone else, but to quote Earl Stanley Gardner, the author of Perry Mason, "Great facts don't make great story." Mm -hmm. and that's what you just said. So targeted facts make good it. world building. Yeah, targeted that's facts true. do, but you don't need everything. I don't know. Who, who was it that said? Every good story deserves embellishment. Sometimes the facts are no, no fun for the story. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead, Kathleen. So, speaking of world building, oh, um, how do you use narration to make good world building? Like, you spend as the you first know, ten Bob. minutes of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and that's and you know we joke about that, but there is a difference to world building in a novel. Versus world building in screenplay and on stage. Brent's joke translates into you need a really lengthy prologue. Yeah. <laughs> oh God, no! You need a mentor character that wants to teach everyone the basics of the entire world. So like a tutorial a classic <laughs> trope tutorial character. So like a fish out of water type thing, or or what? You're the 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 beginning character apprentices, new new mage teacher, or the sword fighting instructor, or the the peasant character that has come to court and their their elderly folks like well I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you the ropes and teaches the reader all about it as they teach the character that way you don't have to as he said build a 10 minute long <laughs> don't, prologue I just think into of the front it. first you know doom or dune doom yes doom doom you have you know doom has a different kind of just start playing it all out there were yes. these planets and there were these guys and they did all this stuff 
Mm-hmm. So, uh, Ryan, I know you had your hand up. Um, once you continue, I've got Chanel down here, and then I've got who else? That's all a bunch of ducktails. Um, I'm gonna wait and hear what these guys have to say. Okay, Ryan and Chanel, and then maybe Jen. <laughs> okay, all right. So, uh, um, we you guys had just said a little bit earlier about how uh, um, you know fact, facts don't always make for for good stories. That, that's a really good point, especially because up in Quincy right now, um, just not to Hannibal. Uh, the Quincy Community Theater is doing Big Fish. Hmm. Okay. And that's like the point of Big Fish, you know? Um, you know, you, if you're familiar with, with the story, you know, you have this kid who's, who's all his life, he's, he's grown up hearing these, these, these fish stories, these big fish stories from his dad, you know? And he's like, is this really what happened now? You know, and it's driven him nuts the whole time. Uh, and it's like, this is ridiculous, you know? Uh, his dad's very much right brain, he's very much left brain, and he wants facts, and they're like, okay, but how did that really happen? And his dad just refuses because that's simply not, not how he saw it. Um, and I love, I love that at the end, like, you know, the movie, for example. Spoilers. In his story, he said, you know, there's, there's these Siamese twins. We're like, well, they're twins, and they're from Siam, but they're not enjoying. You know? <laughs> the first, yeah, the Siamese twins, right? You know? Um, like the facts kind of get lost in the storytelling um but sometimes that tease that that gray that gray area between the two is what makes it really good chanel he had a dovetail on something you forgot your dovetail <laughs> chanel has a really okay. good dovetail. like oh my god i just saw a ghost uh, narration for world building. Ah, okay, world building. Yes, yes, there we go. All right. So when it comes to world building and backstory, I like to. And I heard real. Um, it described really well by a lady whose name I can't remember that I took a workshop from at WizCon. Yes. Um, <laughs> I I will look up her name and I feel terrible, but I can't remember her name to save my life. Um, I'm horrible at names. Go ahead. Uh, but it was like the glass typewriter method. So if you think about it and you think about your entire backstory slash world building for your story and you take a typewriter and you write out on a typewriter that prints out on glass and you write everything on your backstory on that glass piece of paper and then you take it once it's done and you shadow it Mm -hmm. and then you take the shards of it and you sprinkle it throughout your story. I like the description, yeah. So you're not getting any one giant hunk of glass. You're not getting a giant hunk of backstory. It's going to be interspersed in these wonderfully jagged little pieces that are potent and important for your world building, but not overwhelming and too big to get your mouth around. They call those giant chunks info dumps. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or, you know, oh, yeah. also, also things that can be done by, like, as you know, Bob. And never, about the world. <laughs> ever start <laughs> any sentence with "as you know." If they know, you don't <laughs> need to tell them like about it. The, the the one like the one exception to that is when someone is being full of sass, and mm-hmm. I think that happened in like in one of the old Kingdom books because Sabriel's like, "as you know," because her husband was being slow and he should have known better than to put forward what he did, and she was sassing him, and it was beautiful. <laughs> As you know, to prove that you're actually covering up, you jackass. Okay, sorry. <laughs> the other people in the room didn't know it, but like she yes. was like really, really you sweet. You ought to know. Come mm-hmm. on. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> now the um, sorry. I'll go for it, off. please. Um, now that like bringing up as you know, I know this is in the world building talk. We've had that already, so yes. check that out on the archives. So we've done world building episodes before, but um, I watch a lot of bad movies. Like, yeah. really, really bad movies. Um, oh, yeah. And the, that did you know transition is when you know it's going to get real good. <laughs> because that's there's no line that starts with, as you know, that is delivered with any elegance at all. Cause it's, as you know, I'm recovering. You know that I'm recovering from a stroke, right, John? It's like, yeah, you're married to him. He knows that. <laughs> it's obviously there for the audience. Not for John. He knows uh, so you don't want your book to be a Z-list movie. You don't want to imagine that your characters were porn stars previously. 
Or currently. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Because that's who acts in a lot of these movies are people that are, you know, they aren't necessarily the best actors, but they do have an acting credit somewhere. I would not want to be an actor yeah, instead. Is it for it, though? Like, I have to... Not the movie I watched. <laughs> <laughs> the movie I watched. Uh, it was trying to be a sci-fi, and it was failing epically. It was really, uh, like, those kind of movies are great, but they also <laughs> do a good job of teaching me how not to do things. Uh, so, like, world-building-wise and narration-wise, uh, how you deliver something, either in terms of your world-building narrative, talking mm -hmm. about trees, Tolkien-esque nonsense, or your, uh, your dialogue-delivered backstory... Uh, how you use your narrative, if it no longer sounds like it belongs, then your audience is going to be, like, reading it in a stilted, we can't act voice. <laughs> I will say, you can play with that, though. A, a character can always be, oh, as you know, you know, just their little hat, but it could be something along the lines of, I walk into Kathleen's house, Kathleen goes, well, as you know, the coffee maker's over there. And I go, over where? So clearly I don't know. <laughs> it just tells you something that can be done too, but you're right. Be aware your faith right makes you feel smart. Yes, yeah, you know where the coffee those. maker is, right yeah. over there. You yeah. knew this. I don't yeah. gotta tell you nothing. Because yeah. that's flirting really an awful lot with uh, now is not the time. Yes, it is. You know? it, it, you gotta be really careful. Yes, you be pointed and and decisive with your your choice of language. Or if they know each other, wouldn't they just walk in and be like, "Coffee me." Yeah, 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 that, that yeah. would be. This is walk where slang your... comes in. Or coffee me in the Let lady. dialogue take over the world. Or just yes. walk straight over to the coffee maker because you know where it is, and now the audience knows where it is because you walk to it. Or if you come into my house and you say coffee me, I'm going to be like, you know where it is. <laughs> so. See, or... that would be funny. That's, that, that's comedy. That's comedy gold, right? Exactly. Or really. And that's where you get gifts through your voice. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Something that happens uh, Chanel drinks coffee, I do not. We generally come to Right Pack together. So when we walk in the door, David will say hello and then tell Chanel the coffee blend that is that is ready if she would like any there is there is no context yeah. just what was it this morning uh, it today? today is new orleans with chicory yeah so so he'll he'll say that and there nobody needs any context chanel will just swoon and then make a beeline for the kitchen and then david will prepare it for her anyway because he is a gentleman and that is how they say hello yes <laughs> And all our coffee at Right Back Radio is provided, or is bought through Shaw's Coffee, Beans, and Things. Coffee, Tea, and Things. Um, look at it in St. Charles. You can order it online. That's look not it a up. fake commercial. It's, it's not a fake commercial. commercial. <laughs> I just decided to throw this out there. Um, it's not a paid commercial, though. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 keep, I keep them in employment, that's for sure. Um... I do want to kind of go ahead and... I, I was actually bring this to a close with something and then I just lost it. Ah! Um, well, I, we're talking about effective narration. Yeah. So. Oh, yes. This, thank you. You just kicked it off. Effective. You just kicked it. Um, one of our more po most popular episodes, which is about Elmore Leonard and his rules on writing. Please go look it up in our archive. One thing he always said, and this applies to, and as far as I'm concerned, applies to narrative, if not even beyond that, but I don't know about anyone else here. When narrative is bad, I do this, and that is don't write the things the reader skip. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I will skip narrative if it's really boring and not, or not well written. I have said before that I skipped the first half of the two towers when I was reading it. There was nothing but trees. trees, trees. Yes. Just constant trees. trees. And walking. sometimes the trees so talked, walking, but yes. most of the time they didn't. Sometimes the trees walked. I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shaking my head because I am. <laughs> you, you go right ahead, Ryan. You can have my portion. I will. I will enjoy it. Um, okay. Close this out, Kathleen. Oh, well, I was... Just gonna say that um, there are certain certain things that certain people are going to tune out in your story, no matter what. Sure. Like, uh, I my brain just white noises when I start reading scientific explanations for things because <laughs> because yeah. I have no context with which to understand that has not been purged from my memory banks. Mm -hmm. But you know, if if you're writing a story that you want to write and you're writing it in such a way that like the characters stay believable, the situation stays believable, and people aren't you know, doing things they shouldn't be doing at times they shouldn't be doing them, then you'll probably be fine. Excellent. And with that, tune in next week for yet another interesting topic in the writing industry. Like us on Facebook. 
subscribe to wherever it is that you listen to Right Pack Radio, and take care. Have a great week. Have a great week writing. The new theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her. Writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery.